everybody and welcome. This welcome. is a this is a GT Sport little blurb cast where we talk about our experience with the FIA regional finals that were a part of video game Gran Turismo Sport that my friend Tristan and I were a part of. Oh yeah. Oh hell yeah. This is Eddie or also known as Warda speaking to you. And I'm joining me is the lovely Road Beef. Go ahead oh. and introduce yourself. Also known as Tristan, but oh. colloquially as Road Beef since about 1996. Ever since he started riding the uh, bathroom stalls of up and down the Pacific Coast Highway. Oh, you know it. I'm one of the one of the OG bathroom stall note leavers. <laughs> yeah, did he? Uh, but those are some really nice bathrooms in Vegas, though. So we didn't really. You know, we didn't have the time to, or, or we didn't really want to mess them up, so. Yeah, you know, they were nice, but I had the water pressure issues in mind. Maybe because I was flushing the toilet so often. <laughs> really? Yeah, like uh, I would turn on the hot water and it would uh, spray air and noise at me for the first 30 seconds. But, uh, oh, wow. you know, that was like the worst problem I had. Uh, everything else was fine. Huh. You had all the luck, man. I mean, you keep, you're breaking <laughs> water pressure and wheels and hearts. I was, break, I was breaking water pressure and, and breaking the seals in more ways than one. Right. So we had an amazing stay at the Vidara Hotel as part of this video game competition that the FIA sanctioned. The FIA being the same people who pretty much tell Formula One how to run things. Yeah, they're uh, the, the largest automotive sporting body in the world. They oversee uh, almost everything except for like the 24 hours of Le Mans, which is, I think, uh, independently sanctioned, but pretty much yeah, everything ACO. else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it was exciting. I mean, um, I it put a lot of prestige on top of the, the uh, competition. And uh, getting there and getting to meet the FIA representatives was pretty amazing in that driver briefing that they had for us on the first day. That was cool. It like drove home. You guys need to be professional. <laughs> We're watching you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a good suggestion. But in the end of the day, uh, we wanted to go to Monaco, and that that was really that became the focus. You know, after a while. Yeah, it did. I or think after a short while. It was. I think it might have been the focus from kind of the start. It's like we knew that there was some giant golden carrot and. Uh, uh, some crumbs on the way to it, and one sort of intermediate uh, cookie that was Las Vegas that we knew we had to not choke upon to make it to the golden carrot. Uh, uh, but yeah, uh, the story unfolded as it did. Uh, was it what, like 30 of us, right, that that made it to Vegas? Yeah, there's the online portion whittled it down to 30 people, and that's one thing I wanted to start off with was the online uh, experience that we had, which was... You know, for us it was pretty tough because we are we were a plus going into the final season, and the final season was the one that counted. And going into it as a plus is a huge disadvantage because we couldn't take part in these, uh, you know, superstar races that gave out more points. So, you know, Tristan and I really bonded over just mutual, you know, anxiety of over not knowing whether we were going to even be able to go after we put in so much effort. Into yeah, the final season. We had like this competitive disadvantage to start with. Um, yeah. What? Where are the rankings anyway? I I wasn't paying too much attention. It's like you start with E and you move up to D and C and B and A and then S is granted to you after like what? I I didn't even notice what you'd had to do to get S before that final championship. Yeah, the first season there was three th three seasons. The first two didn't really count, but. You needed to finish in the top 200 of. There was two different. It was really wide open. That was another. That was one. The first little criticism ball I'm going to throw, is that it was pretty. It was far too easy to become an S driver because hmm. in the manufacturer side of it, because it was the Nations Cup uh, qualifying, which you needed to be top like so, like whatever in your country. But then there was a the manufacturer, which is like you only needed to be t top 200 in your manufacturer, which no, is yikes. super easy right yeah and so we messed up because we didn't we weren't able to participate for my reason being i was compete or i was working a lot in july it was like this 
uh, kind of upswing of work because I'm I work as a stagehand here in Las Vegas and it's kind of like feast or famine you know some months we're super busy slammed other months we're not so you know, and it's not so so busy so I have time and July was one of those months where I did, had no time what was your situation though for yeah. not not being able to compete in July well you know, I had played the game uh, pretty steadily from February to about May, and uh, I had a hard time identifying um, why I was struggling. I was definitely struggling getting to grips with, uh, I don't know, like wheel rotation, the the, the way the feedback felt, uh, couldn't settle on the uh, feedback and sensitivity settings I liked for my wheel. Uh, uh, I, it wasn't until um, I saw the thread that uh, Rich had made uh, on GT Planet about the uh, non-linear throttle mapping that I finally realized, like, wow, that makes a huge difference for me um, because I'm I'm so thr- throttle sensitive. Um, like all these things uh, made it so that I could I could kind of hustle myself to results sometimes, but I would just uh, often overdrive the car uh, almost by accident. And uh, maybe the reason I didn't take place was uh, take part in those test seasons was I did the very first race of so the first test season like in June or May, and uh, uh, qualified well and did well. I think Nico was in that race along with like Hell's Fire and a couple other people, but I spun twice during the race um, and finished like third or fourth. I think you might have been in that one too. Yeah, Suzuka and, was it? Yeah, it was. Um, yeah. Suzuka. I, I was really frustrated by that result, and I'm like, man, I need to put this game down for a while. Um, I've played some other video games pretty competitively, and I found that if you take like time off when you're frustrated about it, there's there's sort of like subconscious processes that'll happen uh, in the background, like kind of innately without you really realizing it. And the next time you go back to the game, sometimes um, you'll have an approach that you didn't really consciously apply, but uh, the results uh, reveal themselves nevertheless. Um, you know, and by the time the final season came around, I I started to. Uh, hit on all pistons, so to speak, and, uh, and started to kick ass without making so many mistakes. I, 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 I'm still pretty imperfect, but uh, I hope that's a reasonable explanation why I took that time off. Yeah, that's really interesting, and uh, I love that you have, like, you, you really humbled my uh, kind of perspective on the field of drivers that there is in GT Sport. I mean, everyone has, in the sense that everyone has doubts about themselves. And what I thought I thought was really cool is that you getting to regional finals really helps you realize that you deserve to be there. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a big obstacle for everyone. It's self doubt because uh, there are people that are slow that believe they are they believe that they are fast enough to be at the top when they're not. And then there's people that are really fast but still have that self doubt that kind of uh, keeps them from being consistently there when they ought to be, like I think you are. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's an interesting comparison that you draw there because it raises the question of uh, just how useful is um, assured self-belief. You know, someone who who maybe isn't the fastest but is is still super confident. It's like, what is what does that drive give them? What what kind of like extra advantage might that yield um, when it's time to dive for that gap or go for that late break-in maneuver yeah it, it's interesting for them i think in their case its strength will come in the form of them never giving up even if they have a like a spin or whatever uh they're always there they're always there to take uh oppor- take the opportunities that present themselves in the form of like another guy spinning out or uh you know other people's races going badly and them being able to capitalize on it and um and also, just yeah, like refusing to give up on uh, trying to get faster. Uh, they progress at a better rate, and they also one one massive thing is just like mixing it up with faster drivers. You know, uh, t- picking their brains because there are a lot of tricks to going fast in any sim, mm-hmm. but uh, even in Gra- even more so in Gran Turismo, just because. It, it it's not entirely realistic, so there there are some things that you can do, and you need need to uh, kind of uh, get over in order to really be up there. Yeah, yeah, it is a it's it's a very involved game, and um, you know no no sim is going to be a hundred percent accurate, and they all have kind of their little quirks. Um, <laughs> 
you have to become like a professional ice skater to play i racing. You know, not to knock i racing, but that's kind of the reality. Yeah. Uh, and Gran Turismo, it's like, um, you know, it's it's every game's got its different tire model. Um, you know, learning learning the slipstick, the the uh, the traction circle, the um, you know the the curve of uh, how much uh, uh, lateral play there is in the tire, and and being able to predict that and and use that uh, mental acuity to get the car around the corner as fast as you can is is tough. And like every game is unique, you have to uh, develop a, uh, an individual skill set for every sim. Yeah, and that's why I appreciated the little curveball they threw at us at FA, F, the FIA regional finals, which was the, you know, this is one thing that a lot of people mentioned, but not a, a lot of people really uh, went into uh, depth with. But that being the tire model, um, a lot mm -hmm. of people were thinking that the cars felt different, right? Uh, Would you be in agreement? You know... It might have been, but it was uh, it was to me somewhat imperceptible. Um, what what uh, what I liked and what was the most different for me was the the brake mod, the the, the big thick rubber spring behind the brake pedal, physically. Yeah. So um, to put some uh, context on that, uh, we showed up knowing that the competition was going to have everyone use the same uh, TGT Thrustmaster wheels. Uh, the only thing that was weird about it was that. I guess in previous competitions, since there were uh, two other regions, we were the final one. They uh, the previous competitions had TGTs as well, but they uh, didn't have the brake mod. And I, for some reason, we did. And I did have experience with the brake mod uh, because when I got my Thrustmaster T300, it was G the GT edition, and the GT mm. GT edition comes with the same pedals that the TGT does. And I put the brake mod on on a whim just because I was like oh this could be cool I haven't had a brake mod before and I immediately didn't like it <clears throat> but I decided to stick with it for whatever reason so I used it for a good four months and then I just decided to get rid of it for whatever reason yeah. I'm really just random with the, the shit that I do I guess but uh, so I had some experience going in but and you're saying that you like the brake mod and well, yeah I, I like the brake mod not not because I thought it delivered a realistic feeling, which I don't think it did. Um, it, it was kind of a half measure to try and simulate, you know, like a, a actual fluidic brake pressure with like a master cylinder and and uh, actual brake lines and pads and calipers and stuff. Um, I think it would have been uh, a realistic feeling if the pedals were mounted not uh, to the horizontal floor plane, but like uh, to um, 90 degrees up, kind of like if the if the pedals were pivoted uh, above where your foot is pressing on them, so that they would rotate about a different axis. Uh, you know what I mean? Well, oh yeah. When, well, the way they are now, it's like the the pedals want to be pressed from kind of standing more or less straight up to down on the ground. So it's like your your uh, your ankle wants to rotate a certain way, but uh, to add a pressure element to that is like to introduce a new set of muscle memory that you just don't have from driving a normal car because a normal car almost all of them have the brake pedal pivoted uh 180 degrees like up on the uh the top of the foot box rather than on the bottom and the pedal yeah. is therefore rotating the other direction you're using like your calf and your thigh rather than your ankle you know what i mean mm -hmm. but yeah. but what i liked was that it was an equalizer that it seemed like not many of us who were in vegas uh had used that before uh, so it became a, a game of who can adapt the fastest, and that was something I did like because I feel like I'm good at those kind of things. Yeah, and um, I felt like the tire model was different, personally. Uh, the cars felt like they were easier to get on the power with. They weren't as nervous. Obviously, I did a lot of practice with the combo leading up to the event, which was Dragon Trail Seaside for our block race, which is the United States. Uh, Road Beef and I went into it seated number 8 and 9, so we didn't get... Oh, well, I ended up getting pretty good car choice, and Road Beef got his Porsche, but... We were 8th... We, weren't we like ninth and 10th, and someone wasn't able to go? Uh, we were 8th and ninth, and then Stagger was 10th. Okay. And Stagger got... Uh, what is... Oh, he's a WRX, which was... None of us had a bad car, which was great. I, that's a, the way that I kind of figured things were going to go. That was handy. Um... So anyway, I felt like the car 
tire model or the tire model in the game was different, and that was I think pretty apparent from the start. At uh, when because we got there at the club, which was pretty impressive, in the sense that they were able to fit all these things into a small cl venue. Uh, it was a there were two venue. practice rigs in the back, the two two little practice rigs in the back that was like. They were just there. No one told us about them. It was just like, you know, a few guys were already on them as soon as we got there, and they were just we were just left to our own fucking devices to, to use them as we may, and then it, we all organically got into a thing of, oh, you want to do a few laps and then then go? All right, cool. Then he'll go. Yeah. And then he'll go. It was it really was, nice. It was cool that we all well, uh, uh, very quickly decided like none of us are gonna hog this. You know, let's let's be fair about it. Uh, I think everyone there wanted to avoid uh, conflict. Um, there was there was like a yeah. natural natural feeling, a natural desire among all of us to uh, kind of maintain a brotherhood. Yeah, and that's what's awesome about the America Finals. I felt like I don't know. Obviously, we were we weren't at the other regionals, but this is one thing I'd, I want to go uh, back to and talk to. You know. Tom, Georgina, and all those nice folks that helped us about. I want to talk to them about uh, what the what their perspective on the different regions were, because I felt like ours was really tight knit, and we were all super supportive of each other. I would agree. Yeah, that was great to see. So yeah, we we're taking turns on the practice rig. I definitely felt a noticeable difference on our combo because we had Dragon Trail, and the first turn at Dragon Tail, you go downhill into turn one, which is it leads to, sh to a chicane situation. And as you're going uphill, um, you know, you're getting on the power is really shifty because you're, you're going up and turning at the same time. You're cresting a hill. So obviously getting power down is really, really difficult yeah. when you're on the limit. And I you know, feel, felt a noticeable um, ease there. It was definitely easier to do. Mm -hmm. And that's the first kind of impression that was the first time I had the impression that things were different. And so that was another thing that, uh, well, like I was saying before, that was like they're trying to throw curveballs at us in the sense of they want to see how we can adapt. And I thought that was a cool way to sh try to get that. You know, maybe maybe the end result was kind of inconsequential to this question, but I'm wondering if you could, if, since you say that you could feel a difference, do you think it was a difference in uh, the tire model or was it that the track itself had... Uh, a, l a larger base uh, level of grip available. Uh, like, I'm wonder I'm wondering which modifier you think they applied. Right. Um, I don't think it was grippier overall, just because the the rest of the track felt this very much the same. Mm -hmm. um, like, for instance, the chicane felt pretty much the same. But it was just those situations where you're getting the power down. Like, the final corner was a lot nicer. Um, it, yeah. So I'm convinced, but it could still be a placebo effect, obviously. Mm -hmm. But some people uh, mentioned it, had mentioned it to me during the event and stuff. So I don't know. I wonder if there's a way we can quantify it. Yeah, but even if we did, they'd probably change it for next time anyway. Of course. And so speaking about the event, though, so getting obviously me being in Vegas, I had it was great. I got to welcome everyone here. Got to stay at a hotel that I, uh, that's usually reserved for, you know, affluence for mm. for people that are, come to town on you know on a larger budget. So that was really cool. I got to have like a staycation. And uh, what was your general impression of like the hotel and like the venues and all in Vegas and all that stuff? Well, uh, it had been a few years since I was last in in Vegas, um, and I'd only kind of been there for lunch. I never really stayed to gamble or anything. Um, so first extended stay really ever. Uh, the hotel, the Vidara, was nice. It was maybe one of the few non-gambling hotels, which is why I think they picked it to keep us, uh, you know, children <laughs> from engaging in uh, riffraff and and other such uh, 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 unbecoming activities. Um, room was nice. It was clean. You know that that water pressure issue is the only thing I mentioned, but I know water is scarce on like the 39th floor of the hotel, so. <laughs> Yeah, not the biggest deal because the shower worked and the toilet worked and that's all I really cared about. Um, uh, they have a, uh, a uh, they gave us nice buffets at the Aria across the the parking like the little uh, roundabout loop. Yeah, uh, amazing saw, food. We saw Emerson Fittipaldi both mornings. Um, 
the venue itself was cool. I, it was kind of tightly packed, but uh, it was nice. Um, I got a question for you, and I wondered if you can substantiate this. And I forget who I heard it from. It might have been you or someone else, but um, wasn't we all had like the impression that the the whole competition was going to be set up and take place at at SEMA, like inside SEMA. Yeah. But but then like maybe it didn't happen because SEMA have a rule about you can't uh, set up and tear down uh, a site inside SEMA once SEMA actually starts. Do you know if that was true, and and could the marquee have been like a plan B or what? Um, sure. A lot of it. Yeah, that was definitely a rule. The first of all, that is a rule where you can't really modify things as the show once the show starts. But uh, and that, yeah, that's so that's baseline. But I feel now going into assumptions and speculation, I feel like they were going back and forth on a few different ideas, and they kind of landed on the venue for us, which was the club. Um, kind of maybe not last minute, but it was kind of like maybe not a preferred situation. It was kind of like a backup plan yeah, yeah. because they usually do GT awards in those clubs. But um, what what could have happened if they had more time is, or maybe even for next year, if they wanted to have a booth at SEMA, they would need to have like a Gran Turismo booth, right? Mm -hmm. And for most of the time, it would be used as like a an exhibitor or an exhibition booth where, where they would just have normal people come in and, and hang out. But then at some point they would turn into a competition. I see. So you're saying like they would have the, the 12 rigs or however many in total set up for a uh, public exhibition. And then on like the day before the event, they're allowed an exemption to uh, shuffle them around and kind of make a, uh, yeah. a, assemble the commentators booths and, and sort of put on a show. But that would be a pain. Uh, I would, I wouldn't want to do it that way just because it's so loud in there and it would not be good situa a good situation. I think having it off-site but nearby could be cool. But, yeah, we'll see what they come up with. I think uh, <laughs> I think th there's, there's a lot of different ways that you could do it. I, I think it would have been better to have the venue because um, there's the club in, in at the Cosmopolitan, which is Marquee, which is where we had the thing. But then there's also a uh, a, a concert venue called Chelsea or the Chelsea, and it's much bigger. It's like, it's, you know, it's like a theater. Uh, you could have had us be in the floor, air, general admission floor area. Mm -hmm. You could have had, there's plenty of room there to do whatever kind of setup you want. You could have had the LED screen up on the stage area. And then there's seating. There's like a good amount of seating already installed. Uh, so that would have been cool. So that's why I actually put that in our little suggestion box that they... Or our little appraisal, whatever, assessment thing that we filled right. out afterwards. Suggestion for next year. Yeah. But, uh, so... Yeah, dude. I mean, the venues were nice. The, the marquee was kind of, like, uh, tightly packed, but still uh, carefully organized. You know, there you could tell there was a lot of thought put into, like, where they were putting stuff and, and kind of how it went down. Even if it was a plan B, it was still, uh, I think, utilized to its maximum. Um, yeah. You know, there's there's a lot of uh, talk of disappointment that like the block races were not uh, broadcast live, but um, you know they've to Gran Turismo and Polyphony's uh, uh, credit, they've really had to pack a whole lot into you know a month and a half, and now yeah. they're going to do like Monaco in like next week. Uh, that's crazy. That's uh, that's insane logistics. You know, so that they pulled it off in the first place, I think is is highly commendable. Yeah. The theme this year was experimentation and uh, trying to see what works, throwing stuff at a wall, see what sticks and all that. So it was cool to be a part of that. And going into the experience, realizing that was definitely the best attitude. Yeah. And I think it made it made it pretty fun. And now getting to the people, though, uh, just going to give a really quick uh, rundown on some of the highlights that uh, you took away from the getting to meet these you know putting faces to names for the first Dude, time that was like the the highlight of the whole trip you know forget the venue and the hotel which were like yeah. awesome and the event itself but um my takeaway uh the the maximum uh, is in uh the friends made um i mean like let's start with you young man yeah um, you know we 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 befriended our, each other just kind of out of the blue with this uh mini a plus driver ranking championship on the way to this <laughs> thing um and I, I had uh, no real inkling that we were going to qualify at all, and um, 
I thought that like the the not being S ranked and not being able to do the three and a half times points multiplier races was going to be uh, automatic exclusion, and there's like no way we're going to get in. Uh, but we pushed each other pretty hard to do it, and uh, you know crushed a lot of other people in doing so. Um, and when I saw your post on on GT Planet that like you made it, and then you mentioned in the same post that I made it, it blew my mind. Like like are you kidding me? So um, and and since then it's like. Uh, Dude, you're, I would already automatically count you among one of my best friends. Um, it, it's wild uh, what this game has given me, and I am uh, in, in eternally thankful. Um, and, and aside from, from just you, you know, let's set you aside for a second, um, and we get to all the other competitors, um, I don't think there was a single person that uh, you know, rubbed me wrong or, or seemed to be off-putting at the whole event. Everybody was cool. Uh, everybody was super nice. Um, I was almost shocked at like at how um, communal uh, and uh, patient and thoughtful and willing to be uh, engaging like everybody was. Uh, it was a delightful experience for sure in that regard. Yeah, man. It was. And thanks for those awesome words, man. I definitely feel the same. And it's it's one of the best things that came out of this uh, whole. Uh, first season of FIA was getting to help each other get to get prepared and and you know like making sure that we weren't uh, dissuaded or anything at any point. So yeah, and I can't thank you enough for that. So that's it's really it was awesome to finally mm -hmm. get to meet you there. It was finally it was cool to be able to you know it was crazy how everyone had more and more like once we got to meet each other we realized how similar we all really were yeah and it was cool getting to just talk about other stuff that we had in common like with you know learn you know being fans of carl sagan or like sci-fi or cartoons <laughs> or anything like that it's just it's so cool and it makes uh makes me really happy to be a part of the community because all of the guys realize that we're playing we're putting a lot of dedication into this game that um, isn't necessarily the most popular right now, but I think it has a potential to become pretty big if we kind of, if things, you know, go the way that we hope. So For sure. Uh, I, I think we all believe in that. Um, for sure. We, we all want this game to succeed um, and, and to build itself because we can feel the potential altogether. Um, I think that uh, there's there's no better example to uh, prove that, then, um, you know, if I'm if I'm if I may be uh, so bold as to suggest my own example of of choking pretty hard at the competition and being eliminated and being one of the few people to catch the ire of uh, the FIA and receiving a penalty that dropped me to last in the repercharge race, uh, and and so I was quite crushed, you know, emotionally crushed after after binning it and qualifying. I have to admit that I I might have had a little emotional moment back at the hotel room. Um, and uh, it was it was like the bargain basement, the the bottom of um, feeling good about myself. Uh, that was quite down there. But um, once I returned to the venue, uh, and on Wednesday night when we were there to watch the ten finalists go at it, um, I found it uh, surprisingly easy to uh, return to positivity, so I could cheer these guys on. Um, the in a competitive environment, I've talked with a lot of friends who are into Super Smash Brothers, which is, you know, in itself a, a quite a large, like, microcosm of competitive universe. Um, it, it can be so easy to let yourself be salty and, and to be consumed by the feelings of what if, you know, and, and uh, uh, to you'd have to take a long time to get over your failures. But, um, man, I was amazed at how quickly I was able to get, get over my failures and be able be able to sit back and, and enjoy the success of, th of these guys and to cheer them on and um, you know at the end of the event when uh, the top three were up there and like the Brazilian anthem was playing you know sorry for spoilers um, <coughs> it, it was so cool it was so cool to see those guys uh, emote so much and, and I felt like I was right there with them um, I think it's because of, of what we feel the, the potential that exists for this game so um, that's, that's a unique thing for this game it's, it's uh, it, it's something that Kaz uh, Yamauchi wants this game. To, it, it's like his whole goal. He wants the the human emotion to be revealed in this game in a positive way. Would you agree? Yeah, definitely. It's a huge, 
like it was really profound the effect that the game had on everyone and uh, the competition and uh, being there for to experience the passion was, was super intense. Jeez, uh, like the way Fabian reacted when he was able to <laughs> when he found out that he'd be able to go on. He goes Super Saiyan. Yeah, Fabian being a McQueen on PSN or FT McQueen. Uh, that was just so awesome to see, and it makes it you know that's the thing about competition inherently is. If some, when other people take it seriously, when the guys that you're racing against, you know, race to race, you see how much it means to them. It makes you, it gives you more fire to put, give it your all, because that's what makes these competitions worthwhile and feel like so, you know, just otherworldly. Because everyone's giving it their all, and you don't want anyone to just give a half-assed, you know, effort. And that's that's that was one aspect that I that was really um, yeah dude I mean it's know, emotional it's a it's like a direct mo- metaphor for racing if if you're not leading you're directly behind following you know you're you're following immediately in the leader's footsteps following the braking their turn in their their acceleration point the line through the corner you're trying to be just as brave as they are um, hoping hoping just for that small little slip up that allows you to uh, take the reins. Uh, for however long you can manage it, um, it it's like it's it, it's a direct parallel to not just what's happening on track but what's happening off track and uh, it, we we want so strongly to follow uh, the successes of these guys it's it's cool to viscerally experience those those emotions so man like what a great event that's all I can tell you yeah well, and then talking about my block race, uh, it, things were going pretty well because I had started at second, or I started on, on P2 for the race at Dragon Trail right behind uh, Doodle or Andrew McCabe. And so I was, you know, I, th- on the 24 hours bef- between qualifying and the race, I was really concerned about turn one. And turn one on the first race that we had was okay it didn't ha- get as good a run or i didn't get a good enough run to be able to get next to doodle so i stayed behind him for the first uh st- for the start of the first race and then the race ended after like we got maybe just uh, to the third sector or something like that mm-hmm. it ended on the first lap somewhere because tristan's wheel road beef's wheel broke and oh, yeah. then the playstation that was handling the the or the spectator PlayStation that they were using to actually broadcast the race broke down, I think too. I heard someone plugged a printer into it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so sensitive. There's so much shit plugging into one thing. It's like anything could throw it off, and so that was interesting. Now, I th- after everything happened, I, I think about what would have happened if I, if that first race kept going. You know, things could have been a lot different because you were having a pretty good start too. Yeah, in that one. yeah, it, it could have been a lot different. Um, because in that first race before my wheel failure, uh, I got past uh, Stagger Armin uh, at turn one. Uh, I have to admit to you know doing a little bit of rubbing, but it was a clean pass around the outside of uh, the second half of the chicane, and um, you know who knows what have, what would have happened because uh, the first four were were so tight. Like in the first couple of laps uh, at Dragon Trail, um, at the end of the second sector, that downhill braking in the tight right after the kind of the fast sweepers. Um, you guys were, were tussling big time and like all sorts of position changing was going on and I might have been there been there to capitalize but uh, right at the start of the third sector my wheel died, it cranked itself all the way to the left, it went to auto drive and pause and like all the buttons just went dead um, and because the race wasn't broadcasted they, they decided to give me a mulligan and uh, restarted the race and gave us like 20 minutes while they replaced my wheel uh, which mm-hmm. which was like an incredible exception, and I was sure to find all the organizers I could and thank them, because I knew that that was an unorthodox thing that maybe hadn't happened on any of the world tour events, or I might be mistaken, but I knew that like that was a very rare occasion. Yeah. And yeah, in the second race, I I couldn't get past Armin. He knew what to, what to expect, so he defended the inside, and I couldn't peek around the outside, and I had to sit back there and finish where I started ultimately. Yeah. Well, going into the second race for me, I got a better run from the start of the rolling start, and I was able to get a pass on McCabe. And then from there, I just kind of tried to control the front 
which I did pretty well, and then McCabe and McMillan were going at it, and that allowed me to have like a a comfortable two second gap. And after a while, I pulled out a little a little more, and <laughs> a Bruce buffer. Yeah, I had so much time to think. That was a crazy thing. That was like. Ah, uh, it was uh, it psyched me out because I was thinking so much about going to Monaco toward the uh, maybe around lap eight, and I tried really hard not to. It was not like I was indulging myself. I was it was just difficult not to think about it, sure. and uh, so trying to keep those thoughts at bay while trying to you know keep my race going pretty well. Uh, the only thing I felt I was pretty proud of my pace throughout the whole thing, but then. There were a couple times, only re- the only weird moments I had were going through the chicane where a couple times I, I did it really slow. I was just trying to make sure I wouldn't crash, uh, which I didn't, which is good. But then uh, I went into pit for tires. I, I went, I started on mediums, then I went to hards, and then I went to softs. But I stayed out a lap longer than everyone else. And I don't think that was such an issue now that I have, you know, in retrospect, this because right now it's the 8th of November it happened on the 31st so it's been the week essentially mm-hmm. and I've thought about it a lot and I think that what would have happened I, it wasn't so bad coming out you know, staying on the hards for one lap longer because I was going to come out on softs that were much better for the final two laps but uh, if I had just defended properly instead of outbreaking myself and, and crashing I think I would have been able to stay ahead of McMillan and uh, Felix mm-hmm but then I would have had a pretty – it would it would have been tough because they, they were really scrappy. And I don't know if I would have been able to stay ahead of them. I should, you know, on those tires. But it would have been nice because had I stayed out and stayed in front or stayed ahead of them, I think I would have been able to catch Doodle. The That was the other aspect that was crazy. He went past me while I was coming out of the pits. And then I was uh, – he was on really old tire, on, or he was going to be on like three three lap old softs by the by the end of the race. So I think it w- he would have been very catchable. Mm-hmm. So I think I, I, in the end, I feel bad because I robbed everyone. I robbed everyone of a good result or a good race, essentially. Hmm. So I don't know. But then I don't think you robbed anyone of a good race. It was you added excitement to an already good race. <laughs> yeah, it was a different kind of excitement. It was like. Oh, he wiped out. <laughs> He's taking him out. <laughs> what is he doing? <laughs> Eddie Gomez off into the dirt. Oh, he's taking out another competitor. <laughs> yeah. So Dude, that, that kind of sucks. That was surreal, like because it happened right in front of me. Um, going into turn one, turn two, um, you would just come out of the pits. I was still, I was like hot on uh, someone else's draft catching up to you guys. Um, and uh, who was it? Z28. Uh, Jay was uh, drafting me. He and I went into the corner side by side, just as like your drama unfolded in front of me, and and you speared across in front of me. And I think you hit Jay in the side, and it just kind of slowed him down. Didn't really take him out of the race, but uh, man, it's like um, it was like a, a train wreck happened in yeah. front of me and cleared itself just as I came upon it. So I witnessed the whole thing and then was unaffected by it, other than just the shock horror. So it took me a few corners to kind of like shake my mind of that and get back to the, the job of driving, but um, you know that yeah, was ho- ho- very exciting. Hopefully we can get, <laughs> we, hopefully we could get our hands on uh, the replay of that because now I'm thinking like, geez, it if I had, had I known it was going to be an issue for us to get the full race footage, I would have had someone record it, right? Yeah, I I tried to periscope um, all of the races, uh, feebly. I was able to periscope this the second rapid charge okay, but you know it's it was like what it was like being filmed with a potato essentially. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, hopefully they do release it. it we're just we're just going to have to re- recreate it with toy cars and stuff, <laughs> or paper. You know, maybe some uh, construction paper, some diagrams, some stick figures. Stop motion. Yes. <laughs> yeah, people got to see it. But add our own sound effects, add our own to- music track. Our our race was really close. I think they someone mentioned that it was closer than the other block races. As far as like the top, it was, yeah. Something. From from first to last, it was like the smallest interval, I think. Yeah, and you know it was that crash that I had, I, 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 you know, I got back on track, and I didn't even think about the repetage races, because we needed to finish top eight, 
you know, from eighth to third in order to get go on. And I was actually behind uh, Windfire for a while, and I I made the pass on him going into the uh, going into that downhill mm -hmm. uh, braking zone or whatever, and that was pretty pivotal. But even so, after the race, I was I was so not looking forward to the repetition, man, and. Uh, yeah, because I, I kind of I was putting all my eggs in one basket, which also maybe affected things. Mm -hmm. it, had I felt like I was more prepared for the repetage race, I think maybe things would have been more relaxed and yeah. not so crashy for my block race. But yeah, you know, it was that was dreading it. Yeah, um, man, the repetage was it was half skill, half lottery. Um, because the, the draft was so huge with those giant bricks of trucks. Uh, uh, I mean, we saw in the first rep charge, it was like two laps from the end, and it's like the field is too wide, five deep. Uh, you, it looks like the start of the race. And that's, I think that's, you know, not saying that anyone is lacking skills. Like everybody who's there is obviously deserved to be there and very skillful. But um, even in, you know, in like a regular race with skilled people, it's, it's very rare to see the the pack that bunched up near the end of the race, and I think it's because of the draft effect was just so strong with those things. Um, and in talking to Jimmy Broadbent afterward at, at dinner, prior to the uh, top ten three races, um, I I told him how I was kind of embarrassed how I got my penalty because I was I was being like argy bargy, and he said that you know basically it's uh, you kind of had to be if you wanted to get anywhere in that race and. Unfortunately, I was in such a way that uh, it knocked someone off the track right in front of the cameras, and that was not going to be a penalty I could escape. But, uh, I mean, like, how else you were going to be able to do it? The things are just, those vehicles are just too large to not make contact. Yeah. You kind of, you, it felt like I was super close. Like, some points, I felt like there should have been contact when, when there maybe wasn't. I was, when I was getting really close, it was kind of hard to feel out the, the, uh, the footprint of your car, so to speak, to yeah. know how close you could get to a car before it started really affecting the racing. And so, but it's things change, man. It's crazy how for that race in particular, uh, it was like no one really wanted to be racing it. So there was this, this uh, there was like this feeling that all of us were just trying to get it over with and try to just get to the front and and try to hold it out because everyone knew that there was a chance where if you didn't pull away from the pack then the pack was going to eat you alive yeah. which it did so yeah but it was almost impossible to pull away so it was just like this weird hopeful like this yeah it was a lot not a fan do. it was yeah I, I agree it's like it's like when nascar introduced the new aero package in 2012 or 2013 whatever it was and it, it met for like two car tandems uh around daytona and talladega and the, the, the way to win was just uh, timing when to draft another two-car tandem. And you couldn't run in a pack. Uh, it, it, in, it was like an entirely different dynamic that was uh, not up to driver skill anymore necessarily as it was just trying to time the draft and like when you could poke your nose ahead for just long enough to cross the finish line in front of someone else. Um, you know, if, if someone was skillful enough that they could have broken away, uh, uh, albeit briefly, it would have only been able to be briefly because the power of the draft was so much it was like it was it was pulling you along at almost a second a lap faster than if you were without a draft um it, it was it was kind of a i wouldn't say it's a farce but it was mickey mouse uh, but we all had to deal with it so i guess the people who made it deserve to make it right well they intended for it to be a race that was going to cause a lot of action and drama and so yeah i mean we all knew it going in it was it was the writing on the wall it was like you guys are gonna have a hell of a time trying to get top two in this one so good luck it's gonna be fun to watch it was the thing i think a lot of people were looking forward to on the outs outside looking in you know yeah and that's fair it's like if they wanted to maximize entertainment they certainly did it yeah but it definitely felt like this like a uh, yeah, it reminded me of the Nations Cup race, uh, an online sec uh, series that was the go karts, because that wheat draft man was right. terrible. Yeah. But uh, so moving on from the event itself, which we can probably touch on in future episodes and stuff, but uh, let's talk about the future. 
and how we want to improve. And I think I want to take the opportunity to speak to uh, speak more directly to the people that are kind of on the fence about whether they whether or not they want to put effort into these FIA things. Mm -hmm. And and I definitely want to encourage them to do so because I think there are a lot of people like for example yourself that you know even though you had the speed um you're still like oh should i des should i even be trying do i deserve to be there is it going to be embarrassing and it's like no you improve and you f and you find out along the way you improve along the way and you find out more about yourself along the way and then you surprise yourself and once you get there you get to once you get to the next stage whether it's like the final races in FIA or the the physical event or the final regional event itself what once you get there, you learn that you can pick up stuff pretty quickly too, and yeah. you can you can compete, and you can use the energy of the people around you to to find a new level, which is really great. And like the pad users, the controller users, the uh, the DS4 users like NZ and Windfire and Dodge Lamb, like even though some of them wanted to quit, they kept going, and they had a they had a marked improvement. Um, a very surprising time, improvement. Yeah, which is awesome. Every this is a great opportunity to really improve yourself and show yourself that you're capable of more than you know. So yeah, if that might be a suggestion, I, I neglect I didn't think of to now uh, until now that uh, perhaps we could have uh, recommended to the Grand Tourism organizers is maybe like a most improved trophy or like uh, a strongest fighter, um, someone. Um, and I don't mean to pick on anybody, but like NZ, who uh, had not used a wheel, I think, at all until that event, and uh, was was willing to keep trying, and uh, showed amazing improvements um, from the start to the finish. Like that deserves uh, more than one mention. Um, now, yeah. uh, you know, that being said, uh, a couple of things just that I'd like to say about these guys and what I might recommend to uh, our adoring public. Uh, who might be listening mm -hmm. and thinking about uh, competing in future events. Um, whether or not Gran Turismo are going to allow DS4 users in the future, I think is kind of unsure. Uh, they allowed it in like the, the Asia final, and they I think they allowed it at the maybe one of the world tours, but they didn't allow it at ours. And so it's possible that the writing's on the wall, and, and it might be a prerequisite that you, you're going to have to buy a wheel and start getting used to it. Um, but uh, there's a lot of wheels out there, and a lot of them can be had for not much money. And you don't need like a, a T500 RS or something like that to, to be competitive. Um, the other thing is anxiety. Um, I was uh, certainly consumed by anxiety prior to this, and it's always been a, a kind of a, a hallmark um, uh, uh, Achilles heel for me. But uh, for anyone who's out there thinking about competing in this and you're worried about uh, going on the world stage and being in front of a camera, uh, it gets better. You know, you might approach it and have anxiety that you can't help, but uh, particularly because of the welcoming environment of your fellow competitors, especially in this game, um, that anxiety is going to melt away, um, and and you're going to do okay. Um, so hopefully, you know, that's helpful advice. But um, yeah, just just find a wheel and and start practicing. Um, yeah, dude. Yeah, but it definitely takes deliberate effort in the sense of you have to put time aside as well. And one thing you can't avoid is uh, the FIA online series are set up so you can only, you know, for, you, the races are in certain time slots and they're always on Wednesday and Saturdays. As, as, as far as we know, we, well, we don't know how it's going to change for the next official season, but that seems to be like the schedule they're going to stick with. So. That's a, that was a big part of uh, why we were able to get there in the first place is having you know sacrificing time, getting on, trying to figure out when where the fastest guys are going to be racing so you can get the most points. Yeah. Um, but at this point, you don't have to think too much about that. It's just uh, you gotta if you put in because this is this is the reason I say it is because a lot of people have put in a lot of time and are really fast in Gran Turismo Sport at leading up to the final season. But for whatever reason. Once it got to the final season and it became more of a duty rather than just having fun, a lot of people dropped out. Yeah. That deserved to be at the finals, right? Yeah. And so to to put the time in as far as getting faster 
and racing online when you can. But once you get to the position where you know the final season is coming up, whenever that may be, you're going to have to be like, okay, this is where I have to get serious about it. And just for a month, because, you know, that's how long the final season went for. It was all of uh, August. Yeah. For that month, I was dedicated. I was con- I was telling myself, you're going to have to turn down work on w- Saturdays sometimes. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be Wednesdays where you're not going to be able to have, like, a proper dinner or whatever because you're going to have to be racing. And that's just what you'll have to do. Yep. Early on, you're going to have to acknowledge the commitment. And um, I had to do the same thing, you know, uh, turn down a few hangouts, um, turn down, you know, going out to dinner a few times because uh, I understood what the reward might be. And, uh, you know, even if you didn't make the reward, it's still cool to see your name among, you know, like the top 100, top 30, top 10. It's it's amazing to, to know that among tens of thousands of players, um, you know, you can be up there if you put the time into it. Um, you know, th- there's always someone faster, and you can be that person. Um, yeah. This is this is an amazing game because of uh, it, it delivers a way to show you your potential, no matter who you are. Yeah. And one thing I think is cool seeing in, in your uh, evolution is that it's hard to be a lone wolf. And I think what's awesome, once you came... You, you being Tristan Road Beef, once you got into like these chat groups and felt like you're more among the crowd and like you had you were in the group, that's also massive. It's like you gotta run w- with a crew of guys that are also pretty fast, and you gotta learn from them, pick their brains, race with them, and not be shy about it. Right. Because that's a huge element, and that's one thing that that I've seen. Uh, like uh, one example that's kind of obscure. It's from back in the Grand or GT Academy days, there was this guy in the in GT5 named Sun Von Stig. He ended up going to Silverstone in 2013, but his progression was incredible. He went from being literally like the back, the, the you know, the always back marker guy in our league races to being one of the fastest uh, GT players in the world um, mm-hmm. after only about a year. And it was because... Before, he'd only, you know, he wasn't really, when he'd, he'd practice on his own, he wouldn't really, you know, do too much um, practice with other people. But eventually, he ended up getting with these two guys, uh, Jet Racer and Velociraptor. And those two guys, just, just sticking with them, th- those guys were already really fast. But him getting with them, racing with them, uh, you know, frequently ended up, uh, unlocking this insane potential in them. So I think that's definitely worth um, seeking out. Like, it's really hard to be faster on your own. It's not until you run with groups that you start to see your weaknesses yes. and where you can improve. The the bigger the ocean of competitive talent you can immerse yourself into, the faster you'll find a way to float. Yeah, that's a great metaphor. Two points on that one. Nice, nice. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so... Going from there, for personally, what I want to improve on is um, my uh, ability to kind of be fast from the get-go, so like hit the ground running, um, and that comes with familiarization with more of the tracks. Like I, uh, for a long time, I just wanted to run the tracks that I wanted to run. Like if I, if I didn't like the track, I wouldn't necessarily put any effort into it, and that's pretty normal. But um, I think adding just a little bit more time to some of the more obscure layouts and, st- and weaker tracks that I have is definitely going to go a long way. Yeah, it's important to understand the correlation of if you're irritated with a track and and you feel like you don't have the patience for it, well, irritation equals challenge. And you overcome a challenge and you've just improved. Um, you know, it sounds like you recognize that already. Um, if you feel like you're getting tired of something, it's important to recognize when you've plateaued because uh, a plateau means you're not going anywhere. And and that's that's when you need to identify, uh, well, if I've plateaued, that means I need to find a new challenge. I need to look at this differently. I need to see, you know, have I been taking turn one at Suzuka wrong this whole time? Is there half a second that I'm leaving on the table if I change the brake bias and go into it a little bit differently? You know, who knows? 
um, that that overcoming of irritation, having the patience to overcome irritation, uh, can often yield the biggest rewards. Yes, very well said. And then um, another big takeaway for me was um, like kind of uh, running your own race at certain points. So when I had my block race, I came out of the pits, and I was so focused on the guys coming up behind me that I forgot to break in time. And so there, you got to know when to just have tunnel, when to activate your tunnel vision. It's, you, you do, as a racer, you, you want to be as aware of your surroundings as possible, obviously. But there are some points where it really helps you out if you just kind of forget that you're even in a race. Just almost pretend like you're, qualify, you're on a qualifying run or something. Or, just, or, you're, or just pretend that you're out, out on your own. If yeah. I had done that, I would have been able to go through the turn normally. <laughs> and then... <laughs> Uh, another aspect of it was like, oh, I don't want anyone to run into the back of me. There's some like, you know, PTSD associated with that personally. But uh, mm -hmm. had I just, that's the other thing I realized. I told myself, I was like, you know what? You just take your line, break at your breaking point, And if someone crashes into you, they're going to crash into you. It's just, you can't really, you can't really do too much to yeah, it, it's stop so, that. It's so contradictory sometimes how, how sometimes the, the normal execution of a procedure can feel unbelievable. Right, <laughs> it can, in the certain yeah, in the the dullest. The, if you take things as you should, it's gonna feel boring, but it, the end result will feel fantastic. Yeah, it's like your mind is expecting something exciting and unexpected to happen, like uh, being punted or running off the track, and it it almost becomes a self fulfilling prophecy until you can um, uh, willfully put the blinders back on. Exactly, and that taught me to be just more trusting in in the regular and then the rate you know i i just i freaked myself out it's kind of hard to describe but i essentially played myself just like goddamn gj Khaled said but um <laughs> you know he didn't last two hot sauces on hot ones dj Khaled. that yeah, I, sweet, I thought that dude. was very in, in disappointing he's the kind of guy that like if you if you put an onion in his sandwich, he starts crying. It's way too much. Yeah. It's not, yeah. Well, he's uh, making millions of dollars while I'm, you know, just, uh, I've got my day job. So you can't knock him too much, I guess. No, but it doesn't mean I have to like him. <laughs> but, um, very true. Yeah. But is there any other big takeaways that you have, dude? Uh, Vegas is a very arid desert that sucks the hydration out of your soul. Um, yes. Uh, Vegas is a great place to take Chileans to buy uh, obscure Nintendo games. Um, uh, I think it was amazing that uh, Outlaw Quadrant, also known as Rich, got uh, he brought all his like PlayStation Gran Turismo games and his PS2 and got them all signed by Kaz. That was super cool, and I'm happy for him. Um um, man, what the biggest takeaway is is just you know the friendship. It's like uh, I can't wait for another event to uh, to see you guys again. I can't wait for another official season so we can weigh each other up and and evaluate how we've improved or you know what what are the new follies we've come across. Um, it's it's like the first chapter in a big adventure. Um, yes, you know we're we're all writing individual stanzas, uh, and the real question is who's going to write the conclusion. Exactly. Yeah, and hopefully the conclusion doesn't happen anytime soon. I'm hoping for the best. And this, uh, the big takeaway for me, a bit, like this, the one that I would land on, I think, is that uh, this whole experience made me want to improve myself in more ways than one. And I'm, you know, in life, people work. In order to improve yourself, the best thing you can do is set goals, right? Mm -hmm. And what I think is a really awesome privilege that I get to have is, you know, cons assuming that this happens next year again, is I have a, a clear target and goal in mind, and that's a powerful thing. And I'm going to try to use that to improve myself physically, improve myself um, in, on the simulation side of driving, and uh, and also getting to um, have you as, like, you know, a partner in this whole thing. Totally. Uh, and being... Uh, pushing each other 
throughout this whole thing and going forward into the future. I think it's going to be massive, and I feel really lucky to be a part of this uh, first chapter, like you said, and I feel lucky to be able to know such an awesome guy such as yourself mm. uh, and all the other dudes. Like, I, there's, I, want to admit, I want to name names, but I don't want to leave anyone out. All 30 of you, the guys that went... And even some of the guys that didn't go, but were still cheering us on, just can't thank them enough. And I wish nothing but the best of luck to them at the World Finals. And I hope that, you know, whether it's Igor, Nico, Lloyds, like I have a lot of faith in those guys to do huge things in Monaco and to really make a splash for our region. They, they, I feel like they need to bring it home. And I think they, they will bring it home for the Americas. Um, you know, there's there's an, uh, an incredible amount of talent in those guys. Um, yeah. And, and nothing against the Euro and the Asian dudes, but it's time for America to rise up yeah. and represent. Dude, America! Yeah, America! <laughs> Team America, brother. We're going to we're gonna go out and kick ass and take names, yeah. I guess. Mm. You know how Joe anyway. Rogan you know Joe Rogan did this uh, uh, fitness challenge for Sober October where yeah. they're like measuring like their average heart rate uh, and accumulating points for it? Um, I think we should perhaps look into doing something like that. Um, so it's not just a simple push-up challenge, but it's like, hey, we're introducing this competitive element to um, getting ready for the next Grand Tourism right. Regional Finals. Yeah, and I think this this podcast would be a great way to kind of keep uh, tabs on that, you know, for, for sure. everyone to see the progress and see how things are going. And, yeah, it's a great idea. And watch out, I'll have to say also, watch out for... Uh, Andrew McCabe, if he has practice, because <laughs> he didn't practice very much going into the R race, and he still kicked our ass. And uh, the same goes for Nick McMillan. If he has time to prepare, he's gonna be such a threat. And I, I I'm hopefully, I'm, th- I'm pretty sure he's gonna put in some good effort. I, I think the two Americans that are going, it's just uh, we couldn't. Uh, it's just perfect. It's, it's great that they're going. They're gonna really do awesome things out there and i'm really excited to see how the u.s does over there me too totally well you have been listening to wrdz fm las vegas uh eddie Juarez gomez if he's not spinning he's winning ladies and gents thank you for listening thank you so much for that <laughs> over i look forward to the next one dude thanks for having me on this yeah that was beautiful thanks so much uh hope you guys enjoyed it See you next time. Goodbye. Peace.